Hello and welcome to Inside EcoDevo, an economic development podcast helping Missourians prosper. On this episode, we're talking about the Missouri Development Finance Board, better known as MDFB. And sitting down with us is Mark Stombaugh, Executive Director for MDFB. Mark, welcome. Good morning, Eric. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no problem. MDFB is something I don't really know a whole lot about. I've heard it around the office, but I'm really interested in learning more. Before we do that, however, if you could just give us a little bit of background on yourself. How did you come to be executive director for MDFB? Sure, absolutely. And happy to share a little bit more about MDFB with you today, Eric. I guess backing up, I've probably lost track exactly how many years I've been in economic development, but let's say 18 years maybe. But in that time, I've had the the pleasure really of working in a seeing economic development through a variety of lenses. That's statewide. Um, I've spent several years here with the Department of Economic Development, but also local governments at the community level and small and in mid-sized communities, as well as regional efforts in the broader metropolitan areas of the state. So seeing that landscape and most of the time have been able or have been in roles that I'm facilitating economic development projects or the packaging, the number side of making them come to fruition or making them make sense for a community. And I think that's what really led me over to the Development Finance Board is that interest in packaging and working on unique opportunities and being able to partner across the state of Missouri and work with all those communities was really exciting. So I was appointed by the board as the executive director, I guess, at the end of 2021 and and just started this endeavor relatively a short time ago there at the beginning of 2022. And a trend I'm seeing with a lot of the guests that we have on here is that their career paths have been economic development. And once they've got in there, they've kind of stayed in there. What was it that kind of led you to want to make that as a career? As I've built some teams and worked with a lot of folks over the years, I, I kind of joke that that no one goes to school to be in economic development coming up. I, I think that's changing a little bit in the landscape today. But, you know, my undergrad work was really in finance. And so I, I always gravitated a little bit to the numbers. But in economic development, whether you consider it kind of a a marketing role or finance, whatever the case may be, you have the ability to work with so many great team members, great partners. And and I think that's what kept me in economic development. There's a variety of challenging fields or specialized fields that economic developers may get into. But I think being able to work statewide, for example, and, and see that communities do economic development perform economic development very, very differently. Communities' priorities are very, very different depending on where you go in the state. So there's always that uh, variety, if you will, or opportunity to work on new and unique things. So let's kind of dive into it. Let's hear more about the Missouri Development Finance Board. What is it? What does the team do? We don't try to hide, I guess would be what I'd say, but I don't know that we're as widely known by our partners throughout the state and hopefully look forward to continuing to grow that a little bit. MDFB is a separate body, a a public organization that's governed by a board of directors that has 12 different members. But our primary purpose is to facilitate infrastructure and economic development projects. And we do so by providing critical aspects of the overall financing package for these projects to be successful. I mentioned a little bit about the the board just because we have such a vast variety of experience and expertise amongst the board. That is filled first first and foremost by four individuals that have those positions by title, you know, being uh, acting director Coast, as well as the executive agency directors for the Department of Agriculture, Department of Natural Resources, and then the lieutenant governor is our lone elected official on the board. And then we have up to eight additional appointed members that come from all over the state of Missouri, all different backgrounds that really support us in trying to fulfill that mission. When you talk about what the team does and what we do on a, on a day-to-day basis, we're a small but mighty group. We have five of us over there um, in current form, maybe five to, to seven individuals. We administer a couple of different programs tax credit program, similar to some of the discussion points that you've talked with division leaders within the department. We administer a few of those tools on an ongoing basis, but we also have a couple of strategic investments throughout the state and other third-party opportunities that we have to manage a little bit more actively, you know, longer-term opportunities that we've partnered on economic development projects that we have, you know, ongoing upkeep and management that we work on. And you had mentioned some of the 
other departments that are involved or, you know, they're a board member, the lieutenant governor, but it's a public entity. How does it fit within state government? The nuance is not that nuance, right? It's a body that was created within the Department of Economic Development, but it is a separate body. And, you know, if you think about it from the state's perspective, we're a component unit of the overall state of Missouri. So we do act, you know, we are a public body on behalf of the state of Missouri. And was it designed in a way that it can facilitate outside the state government? You know, like it can function in a way that the state department can't? I I guess I'm just trying to to see kind of you know, how it fits and, and where it's like focus and sure. all that stuff is. Sure. Yeah. And, and, and I don't think I, I really addressed your other question about the other agencies either, because I could frame that essentially it's the financing piece. It's we are the arm of the state government that can access the bond markets and other structured finance vehicles that the executive agency itself cannot. So some of that is just statutory authority to issue those kind of debt instruments. But similarly, in, in Missouri, I wouldn't say we're necessarily unique But we have other financing arms and financing bodies, like the Department of Natural Resources has a a separate body that does some uh, loan-related work for them, as well as the Small Business Authority at the Department of Agriculture. There are similar kind of partner agencies, quasi-governmental agencies within the state of Missouri. Okay. And how does that kind of structure, how does that allow you guys to work in a way that I guess a full-fledged government department can? I guess you guys have a little bit maybe more leeway. You guys can touch uh, some areas that a proper department can't, or if I'm off base there, yeah. please correct me. No, I, I think that's that's fair leeway or, or flexibility is fair. It's almost just that we would be the body that would take that kind of action if it was necessary. So we do have a little bit more flexibility to get into a project without here's just the scope of the programs that we can come to the table with. So from that perspective, and, and obviously we would have we started at, you know at one point in time or another with investments by the state, with resources by the state of Missouri. But since then, we've been able to generate both fee income and, and other returns from those investments that, you know, from those strategic long-term investments. So we do maintain our own pool of resources that we can loan or we can actively participate in financing for projects. Gotcha. Okay. I understand. What is, and I'm sure you probably kind of mentioned this in what we've talked about so far, but the primary focus for MDFB, is there like a single point of here's our motto, here's our target, we're going for it? Two critical pieces probably like, and and I, I mentioned materially or critical aspect of financing and as most organizations do, we want to partner on projects that are ultimately going to be successful. So we have the ability, but also the responsibility, I guess, to be more aware of how a project's going to be structured financially, where those sources are going to come from, and are tasked with getting more in-depth into those projects to make sure both that the state's role we're being asked to play makes sense, but also that it's going to make sense over the you know, the course of the investment or over the time of the project. So I use materiality or a critical nature. We want to focus on projects that can't otherwise, you know, find this missing piece of the financing, fill this gap that need our flexibility or our efficiency to be the right partner. And then we want to make sure that those projects are going to be successful if we're going to partner with them. Uh, what kind of projects typically are you guys handling? In terms of overall activity, you know, we, uh, I think, I mentioned we administer a couple of programs that are similar in nature that function with state tax credits to support community needs, as well as support large scale business development oriented things. So the same kind of job creation and capital investment that the department and MDFB, we are both, you know, chasing after those great opportunities. So that's an area that we partner, but those projects, I don't want to say on a larger scale, but I think that's kind of the tipping point. If we're partnering on a community need, it's going to be a need that they've been wrestling with for a while and and is on a scale that makes sense for MDFB. It makes sense for the state of Missouri to come and help push them along. And the same thing on the job creation side, it's I've always kind of asked the question of what are the impediments to that project being successful today? Or what are the impediments to that private investment taking place? And when you've got a lot of that private investment or a lot of moving pieces, a lot of infrastructure needs. That's where it makes sense for the state through MDFB to come in and be a, a partner for those. 
You had mentioned a few programs that you guys administer. Can you go into more depth there? What kind of programs do you guys have? Sure. And and I, I kind of bucket it into four things probably, you know, and I'll, I'll start with the, the couple that we may be more known for. The first is a contribution tax credit program, but the purpose is helping communities fulfill needs or identify needs. And we're largely focused on public infrastructure, but public infrastructure, you know, can very easily be defined as, you know, the community support network around some of the social service activities, some of job training, you know, a variety of different things, but the infrastructure for a community to be successful. So we'll partner with those on those projects to help a community raise money, leverage money from the private sector, and we'll reward those contributors to that cause with a state tax credit. So those are, it's easy to say it's infrastructure oriented, but they really do vary by the community and the community, why we can have some some targets. The community, by and large, brings us their challenge, brings us their need and the opportunity. And then we work with them to, to kind of scope out how these tax credits could help facilitate them raising additional revenue to fulfill their need. The other one is more of a business development oriented tool. And this is a, you know, a direct line and partnership with the department as well as, as organizations like the Missouri Partnership. When we're doing, whether it be business recruitment or just existing business growth opportunities, those opportunities in a very competitive landscape, but also those opportunities, again, may have different hurdles depending on what community they're in, how much space they have to grow, you know, do they need additional infrastructure? And those are the kind of things that when we look at those on a large scale, we have some tax credits, a financing piece that can come to the table to help reimburse them for certain costs. And that's our, our large scale development or our build bonds. The third bucket, you know, generically is just our ability to loan money. We have a couple of more targeted loans, whether they have in the past been for small business or communities themselves to help maybe bridge some gaps or get them access to like the broader state revolving loan funds. We're just playing an overall piece of those financings. And then the fourth is really, you know, I'd say broadly speaking, revenue bonds in general. As a political subdivision, we have the authority to issue revenue bonds. And there's a whole nother fun podcast for those folks that are interested in tax exempt debt and, and other things. But we can do tax exempt, we can do taxable, we can do conduit financings for community partners out there, really just trying to find where that value is for local governments or the state as a whole. You know, we we have partnered to help structure financings with the Office of Administration, for example, where the state has identified a need and we are just helping kind of package or put together the overall financing. You mentioned when companies or people are using these programs and they're coming to you guys and you're working with them, are they reaching directly out to you guys? Is it some, uh, are they getting to you guys through DED since you're kind of like an arm? Like how does that process work? A little bit of both. You know, MDFB was created in, in 1982, I think. So by now we do have pretty in-depth community partnerships across the state. So they may come to us directly if they have a need, you know, maybe we've worked with them successfully in the past, or maybe they just know they can come to us directly. But I think you're right, the reach of the department as a whole, and just the awareness of kind of where DED's tools might not necessarily stop, but some of the edges of what solution delivery you guys can bring to the table, we are often brought into uh, an opportunity, a community need together with the ED or through the resources of the department. So I think that's a good jumping off point to talk about the partnership between MDFB and DED. I know it's kind of like an extension, but you guys are kind of your own thing. Can you talk about just how that partnership works? How do our two entities work together? Sure. Closely and well, I hope, and, I, and I, I'm sure Director Coast and, and some of the rest of the team would, would agree with that. We've been you know, that arm of DED for a while now, so I think we've been able to fine tune that. But I think, as I kind of said, maybe on the edges of your programming, I think of the department's tools and resources that we both probably serve as a little bit of that kind of vetting point for different opportunities when we're communicating with a community about a project or about an opportunity. So we can ask the right kind of questions to help the department understand if they can plug in or help MDFB understand if we can plug in. And by and large, those aren't you know, we don't have separate sets of questions, if you will, but we're trying to understand what the real need is, the overall impact to the state, and just 
uh, not least amount necessary for least amount necessary, but how can we prudently use these resources in a meaningful way, but also mindful to stretch the public investment and public dollars as far as we can. I'm just sitting here thinking that, you know, we're talking about the partnership that these two entities, I'll just Mm -hmm. use that terminology there. And then there's also Missouri Partnership, which we previously talked with Sabas Alias on, DED proper. And then there's some like little (laughs) fingers that come off to Mm -hmm. really, I guess, tackle the challenge of economic development and bringing prosperity to the citizens. So I think that kind of really kind of sheds light on the importance of economic development and all the different facets there are. Can you just talk a little bit about that importance and how, I don't want to say blanket coverage, but there's all these different little entities that are all trying to work towards the same end goal. Absolutely. You know, you, you've heard the mantra, it's a team sport, but and certainly touching on the Missouri Partnerships team. And, you know, I, I probably don't answer that question well, just because I've been at DED and over the course of multiple years. So I've had the chance to to work with the department from inside and across multiple leaderships, but also I've had the opportunity to partner with the department from a local level as well. So this it's very normal for me to partner with DED and those lines are probably <laughs> blurred, you know, from the outside. But I think MDFB partners behind the scenes maybe is another way to put it on a lot of different projects. You know, Sebastian has an outstanding team there at the Missouri Partnership, but some of those successes, we could say most of those successes, but we're going to be working as a team behind the scenes, whether it's it's Michelle or Acting Director Coast or the regional engagement team, that, that there's a lot of overlap and there's a lot of, you know, picking up the phone and asking questions, whether it is a, can MDFB do this? Or it's, hey, we're working on this opportunity and here's the challenge. I think the team, as it were, does such a great job of, of not really you know, it doesn't have to be MDFB's solution. It's the state of Missouri's solution. And that's whether the Missouri partnership is working on it. It's that's frankly, whether it's being led by a, you know, public private partnership at the local level as well. We want it to be a win for all to, and, you know, ultimately if we're going to achieve that goal of, of helping Missourians prosper, you're going to need a big team to help accomplish that. Yeah, for sure. Kind of jumping around here a little bit. So I apologize. We were talking about the programs that you guys administer and I had neglected to ask a little bit uh, more there. So I kind of want to just jump back and dive I was hoping you were letting me off the hook. <laughs> so the programs that you guys have, is there an intended pointed purpose for the programs? Is it kind of a wide use or is there some nuances there? Yeah, it's it really is a wide use because I, you know, I kind of go back to that public infrastructure focus. And certainly in the authorizing statutes for any of these particular programs, there's probably an independent definition of what public infrastructure actually is in that context. It is very broadly applicable. So our contribution program, you know, like I said, we've we've worked on job training oriented things that are being driven by local nonprofits. We've done community revitalization efforts where we're helping bring service agencies together. Um, We've done projects where we're helping kind of bridge divides where over time there's just been disinvestment or or not investment in certain areas of communities. And we're helping kind of encourage those activities to take place. So public infrastructure is water lines, sewer lines, roads, you know, bridges. I can keep going, but it's also, you know, any public facilities, community facilities. We've helped provide small pieces of financing for rural fire district, for example, um, other things. It really does run the gamut. So the tool that itself can be very flexible in how it's applied, but how we work with communities is pretty, you know, is a pretty straightforward process that just tries to address their particular need and, again, helps them leverage up other resources that they might not have been able to access. And that seems to be like the, the common denominator when I've talked with different program leads and people working on different programs for communities, the bottom line is flexible Mm because I think each community is a little different. The need is a little different. So it has to be flexible to to fit the need. So the use of it is towards as many people as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, I'm certainly one that embraces, I guess, or or that, that signs on or tried to help direct, you know, the department's effort to really allow communities to to be themselves and and tell us what their important 
uh, what their challenges and what their needs are, what's important to them, what are their priorities? Because, you know, not just the old, we don't, we can't always make the best decisions in Jefferson City kind of thing. We will identify targets or we've developed kind of initiatives and programs that we say we want to do work in downtowns across the, the state. You know, we had a, a really successful, a really, a really neat dream project that, that worked in downtown downtowns across the state for a number of years. So we can target it, but by and large, what we're saying is we can help you access additional resources. We can try to help take your money a little bit further through our partnership, but we're open to hearing what your community actually needs. Or, you know, I go back to that workforce development component, certainly uh, one of Governor Parson priorities that we can communicate that we want to partner on those opportunities and certainly have successfully, but by and large, we're, we're asking communities what they're experiencing, what their needs are. Are there areas that you guys see people typically want to use these programs for that they can't be used for that maybe people should know about in the confines of, you know, how they're used that is? Yeah, I don't know. That, that's a, that's a good question, Eric, but I, I, I think, you know, maybe just that, that particular program has been around enough. I don't, I don't know that we get a lot of requests that are, this doesn't work. We get a lot of requests for more money than we have. I, I was going <laughs> to nicely say unrealistic requests, but it's not usually typically, it's not that what they're trying to do is not something that works for us. It's just at the end of the day, we only have so many resources. And so, at, you know, from an overall priority standpoint, either we can't participate or we can participate, but it's going to be on a much, much smaller scale just so that we can try to spread the resources around the state and get the most <laughs> the most out of them that we can. Yeah. And forgive me if you've already mentioned this, but is there an intended group that these programs are used for? Who typically are uh, is using these? Yeah, maybe to say that, you know, a little bit of that shift or a little nuance, maybe from some of the department's tools is, by and large, we work through our community partners, so your local city and county governments. They will be the applicant in most instances, but in some instances, they're simply sponsoring an activity that might be taking place by a nonprofit in their community or even a private developer. But so in all of those instances, we have the community with us at the table, again, to kind of help understand that it's actually their priority as well, whether or not, regardless really of how they're deploying resources to help make it make sense, they're a, a party to the overall project. So we work directly through those community partners across the state. Okay. Switching gears just slightly, what current work is happening right now? Anything big, exciting going on? Always big and exciting things, right? The project activity wise, there's always, it's a fun time to be in the state, right? Not just because the Chiefs are winning football games every other week and, and championships, but there's a lot of catalytic development going on out there. So I think, you know, it's safe to say at any any one point in time, we've, we're hearing and, and trying to work with community partners on maybe five to 10, you know, catalytic type projects. But just stepping back kind of organizationally, what are we focused on? We've got a handful of long-term investments that we've had for a number of years. And that I think we've kind of reached that point of reevaluating those to make sure that they're structured in the right way. Is MDFB the the right caretaker for that asset or for that solution, that parking garage, for example, or otherwise? So we're spending a lot of time on that. And the, the purpose is never, you know, our mission is, is not profit driven per se, but we're trying to maximize the resources. We want to maximize resources and produce return, produce revenue so we can get into future economic development projects so we can turn around and help another community. So we're evaluating some of those things right now, but we're also in, and I don't want to get too far ahead of the board, but I think this is a, a policy area that my chair and our board and previous executive directors, our team has been focused on trying to do this for a number of years of really driving our reach into some communities that we haven't had those successful partnerships in the past. And we can assume or or we can say it's just they haven't had the right opportunities. I think that's that's probably not the case. I think there's partnerships and there's public infrastructure needs everywhere. And so we're really focused on that. And I think heading down a path of trying to create a pilot kind of program where we can try to deploy some of the resources a little bit differently than we have in the past and learn as we do it just to say, is there a, you know, maybe it's not a new standalone program, 
but maybe we can craft some different guidelines, different policies, different ways of achieving those public infrastructure projects for some of the smaller communities that are out there. And are you guys typically, for lack of a better term, going after projects? Are you waiting for people to come to you to use the resources? And I guess I would just kind of equate it to partnership where, you know, they're actively seeking out businesses and trying to get businesses to expand and move to Missouri. So they're kind of like, uh, I'm trying to, the only word coming uh, into, into mind is offense, you know, mm-hmm. like you're, uh, you know, you're going after the thing. Is that kind of what MDFB is doing? Or are you kind of more of somebody comes to you and then you guys provide the support? Yeah, I, th- I think I was going to say more of a supporting role would, would, would be the best way to describe it. And it's not a, we would like to be doing community outreach as well, but just the the nature and size of the team is small enough that, you know, when I say we wouldn't blow anybody away with the number of projects that we get involved in or that we do on any number of years, but it's, it's, it's more so maybe the complexity of those projects that we are involved in that really require more active engagement with the project, whether it be over the course of 12 months or whether it be over the course of five to 10 years. So we are very busy internally just with those kind of ongoing projects and relationships. We would love to do more what I would call just business development or just outreach. But I'd say we do that when we can. But I certainly would say we're more supportive and typically being brought in on challenges, whether that be from, you know, folks like the Missouri Partnership, you know, our community partners, our our, our regional entities or the department. Gotcha. Uh, When we first started talking, you had mentioned that MDFB, probably not the most well-known or widely advertised entity to use, but it sounds like there's a lot of help that could be had there for communities and whatnot. If somebody is listening to this and they just realize, oh, wow, this is, this is an avenue that we could go down. What, what do they need to know to, to start working with you guys? Oh, that's a great question. And I think, you know, that's one of the things that I, I hope that I've been able to bring, right? I hope that I can bring to the organization is just that willingness and ability to try to be flexible and find solutions. So if I'm coaching those that are coming to us, I don't want to start with like patience, but if you've got a challenge that you can't find the solution for, I want very much so for people to be open to reaching out to MDFB and, and I want to explore those. But when I say like we have four programs, we don't have 20 programs. We don't have, you know, five different sub programs, or I, I probably don't have a roadmap for exactly how we've done that kind of project and in a community similar to you or, you know, and timing is key in any kind of development opportunity. So, so I recognize that you can't ask for patience if you're also trying to tackle some of these challenges that, that communities are facing. But so from that perspective, if you're open to dialogue and, and you have, and you have the willingness to be flexible on the other side of it as well on how you're deploying both your private resources and within your community and your public dollars, then absolutely uh, let us know how we can help. Because I think our job is to maybe understand the landscape of partners. And we don't want to be in a position where we're competing, if you will, either with local commercial lenders, um, other financing bodies, the department or otherwise. So we can definitely talk to you about these opportunities and see, are there other buckets that we could redirect you to, or is it really something that we can kind of massage together and work out a potential solution for? As we've kind of mentioned here, each uh, scenario is a little unique to the business, to the community, but do you have any kind of examples from the past of challenges that were brought and you guys overcame? Yes. Um, you know, I, I threw in the parking garage commentary earlier, and, and certainly this is a little bit more unique or, or more specific to our urban areas in the state of Missouri. But structured parking is also a fairly easy thing to understand that that's very hard to pencil out for a development. It's very hard for regardless of the type of development, office, retail, commercial, you know, however you look at it, structured parking is expensive and it's challenging to do. So we've been able to come to the table and kind of leverage some of these tools that we have available to us to drive down the cost of those kind of things for certain projects. And then that's an example where those there are certain opportunities where we can actually take an active role and own and kind of manage those those assets. So while I joke with folks that, that we're not the parking, you know, it's not the Missouri Development Parking Organization, that's a conversation, a need that we have have found success with other community partners and kind of back to the 
public infrastructure definition. It's just one of those pieces of public infrastructure that we understand by nature of, of plugging into it over time. I'm trying to think of another real good example um, that would be more community focused, but I think that gets back to just it's depending on the community needs. You know, we've we've had exciting partnerships with long-standing institutions and just out, you know, great assets in the state of Missouri, like the Danforth Plant Science Center, like Forest Park, like, you know, on, on the west side of the state, the World War I Museum. Um, we've had some successful partnerships in the Springfield area, some helping redevelop downtown. So, so there is definitely some overlap of we've been able to come in to different community needs and we can repeat that going in, in other communities for sure. Yeah, when you were talking there, it kind of sparked a thought that I had where, you know, something like a, a parking garage seems simple enough on paper. Oh, build build the structure, cars park there. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of complex ways to get around the, the challenge, right? Like mm -hmm. it's a simple thing. The, the structure itself is simple in its idea, but getting there is a challenge or could be a challenge. Yeah, yeah definitely. And, and I mean, it's like a lot of, it's a, maybe it's the the wrong example for a lot of business models, but there's a lot of things you've got to look at in there. You've got to analyze the demand and the need. And then, you know, what time of day is that demand and need there? You know, we're sitting here in the state capital, and, we, you know, we park in a garage here in Jefferson City that is a lot busier when the legislature's in town than it is the rest of the year. So so how do you make that those shifts and how do you make that work? And at the end of the day, if you put it all in just a finance context, a, a math problem context, it's not the the end use is very important then you know and, and again the need and the market feasibility is very important and we're going to look at that but it's really getting into the details of how does the financing actually work how do how do the capital sources come together to achieve that project and i guess at the at the heart of the matter that's probably most of economic development projects. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just we sum, summed it up right there, right? <laughs> that, that it is, you know, it's very dependent on the type of use and what outcomes are you achieving as a community? You know, job creation is easy for everybody to understand. Everybody wants that. But how do you go about that and what partnerships really make sense and then get the most bang for the buck? Uh, well, I think we've covered quite a lot. Feels like we did. Uh, I have one more question that usually closes us out here. But before I do that, I'll just open the floor to you. Is there anything regarding the Missouri Development Finance Board or just economic development in general that we didn't cover that you think people should know? No, I think, you know, MDFB, I'm really focused on trying to find additional areas where we can add value. You know, we summarized with four programs or the flexibility in broad sense. We can do a lot, but I want to make sure that we're focusing on helping communities, not that they have done their own homework, but they have clearly identified their priorities. But I want to make sure that we're adding value just because there are a lot of other partners that we talked about that maybe it's more appropriate for Missouri Partnership to be at the table or whoever. So I'm just really, you know, I would encourage anybody to to reach out to our team and give us the kind of feedback that they want to to understand. We may be coming to the table and saying, well, we can do X, Y, or Z. And and if, if the community says we've got that under control or I can I can do that through a different partnership, we want that feedback because I think it helps us it helps us sharpen the tools that we have, focus our efforts and energy where we're getting the most impact for the state and delivering value for our customers at the end of the day. So, you know, those are things that we think about pretty regularly. And I just I, there's a slew of people too much too big to mention that already take me up on that on a daily basis and that are really there to help MDFB continue to be a valuable resource over the long run for the state. So happy to have all those partnerships. Anybody who's listening, if they want to reach out to you guys, how do they do that? They can give us a call up at the office. Um, you, if you wouldn't have asked me that phone number, I might've been able to get it, uh, Eric, but our, our website's um, mdfb.org. Feel free to visit us there. We are uh, aware we need to get a little bit of a refresh there, but all our contacts information there, I mentioned, you know, we're based here in Jefferson City, but have car will travel, you know, smaller team, but we're certainly open to meeting communities to both lay eyes on um, things that they're working on, but also just flexible however we can take the resources to them okay so to close us out here the question i always kind of end with everybody here 
uh, DED's motto is helping Missourians prosper. And I know MDFB is not DED proper, but you know, we're, we, we do the same work and you guys are an extension of us. So how does the work of MDFB help fulfill that motto of helping Missourians prosper? It's providing that critical component sometimes in a project that that might not be might not be the flashy component. Like you, you, when you start talking about water lines or sewer lines, or these things are all necessary and they're needed in varying degrees. But sometimes they are the challenging one that there's other people down the road that can provide this service or that service. So we're trying to plug in in an area that we can move the project forward in a meaningful way. And we're willing to do so on things that it maybe MDFB understands more so than, you know, your local lenders might, or just, you know, we're willing to, not, I don't want to say take other risks, but we're willing and set up to plug in for those kind of opportunities where there might not otherwise be a resource. All right. Mark, I know it's a busy time. I always say that to every guest, but I know it's a busy time, especially in economic development. So we do appreciate you sitting down and taking some of it to give us this great information. No, absolutely, Eric. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to this episode of Inside Eco Devo. We have great episodes coming your way every two weeks, so be sure to subscribe. Also, we want to hear from you, our listeners. Tell us what economic development topics you want to hear more about. This helps us fulfill our motto of helping Missourians prosper by bringing content to our listeners that they want to hear. Leave a comment on an episode or send an email to ded.communications at ded.mo.gov and stay tuned for more Inside EcoDevo.